It's an honor for me today to welcome our very first guest lecturer today to the racial state, Tabitha Lean. Welcome to uh, Western Sydney University School of Humanities and Communication Arts and to our class, uh, The Racial State. So The Racial State is a semester long unit that critically examines race, racism and white supremacy within the context of ongoing colonization. And I want to say that it's an explicitly anti-racist class where we don't treat racism as a matter of opinion, but as a sociological fact. Now, I'm joining you today from unceded uh, lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I would like to pay my respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here. I remind myself and all of you that whatever country we are on, these always were and always will be Aboriginal lands. Universities are built on sovereign Aboriginal lands. Western Sydney University operates on the lands of the Darug, Tharawal, Eora and Wiradjuri nations. And the theme of today's lecture is abolitionist visions. And it builds on our discussion last week of the police and the carceral system in Australia as racialized institutions that in many ways have been designed to surveil and punish indigenous people and other negatively racialized and poor peoples. Now as students and educators, it's worth remembering that the university is not neutral in all of this. Universities have been and continue to be complicit with the state's repressive institutions and they are very much part of the colonial project. So when we discuss these issues, it's important to think about the role that each of us brings in upholding the status quo and to think about what we can each individually do to bring about change. I try to incorporate a critical reflection on my own role as a migrant settler on Gadigal lands, the benefits that accrue to me as a result and how I can use the spaces such as this virtual classroom to question why things are the way that they are. There's no better person to help us to answer these questions than Tabitha Lean. Tabitha Lean is a Gunditjmara woman born and raised on Korna Yerta. She is a storyteller, poet, artist, and an abolition activist. Her work, based on her own experience of the prison, helps us to imagine a world where, in the words of the US American abolition activist Mariam Kaba, we can address harm without relying on the violent systems that increase it, like police and prisons. We can imagine a world, as Tabitha has written, where we all have safety, which by definition must be a world in which everyone has freedom and justice. Now, a few years ago when I was teaching on police and prisons, it was almost impossible to raise questions like, well, what if we abolish the police? Or what if there were no more prisons? Students couldn't really get their heads around the idea. Today, thanks to activists like Tabitha and many others, like uh, Debbie Kilroy of the organization Sisters Inside, or Latoya Roja Rule, who has just successfully campaigned to have spit hoods banned in South Australia, as I shared with you on Views the other day, it is much easier to have that discussion openly and honestly. We can now begin to ask how we can free ourselves from the internalized belief that society cannot be safe without institutions that detain those who we have been taught to believe are bad. We could begin to think collectively for alternatives based on care rather than fear. So I want to thank Tabitha very much for coming to our class today. And I now give her the floor to share her wisdom with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen now try to anyway. <laughs> okay. Well, nyata nyata ma nyatuk nyatleon putamin ya nyatuk gundijmara mayapa wanga nyuntu wanya pumia ala min gana mirin tinwen ye yana popa mirin. Nyata everyone, my name is Tabitha, or as my ancestors know me, Budun Minyan. I'm a Gunditjmara woman born and raised on Ghana Yurta. My name, Budin Minyan, roughly translates to Big Sister Sunbeam, and it was a name given to me by my sister Yalilan and my Nyama. And I want to thank you for having me here today to share my views with you, and I hope my contributions are useful. As is proper way, 
I acknowledge today that I stand on the lands of the Ghana people. In fact, I'm zooming in today from the back of my camper van. Um, as an uninvited visitor on the lands of the Ghana people, I offer my deep thanks to the Ghana elders for allowing me to tread on these soils, to bathe in these waters and in, to enjoy these breezes. Specifically, I live in the southern suburbs of this nation. I live very close to the ocean. I'm grateful every day to feel the salty sea air tangle itself in my hair and catch a waft of sea breeze every time I step outside. I have a lot to be thankful to the Ghana people for because this country has been my home for my whole life and I hope to always remember to walk this land with soft feet and open heart and deep respect. I also want to make the very specific point that my capacity to do this work in this space and place is leveraged off the continued dispossession of the Ghana people from their country. And it's something that's really important for me to remember that because the fact that I am living here means that Ghana people do not have right now the control over their own land because settlers control it. This is stolen land and I'm occupying it. But I'd also like to acknowledge today the lands that each of you stand today the place you live, study and work on, the waters, the sky, the hills, the valleys, the rivers, the lakes, the oceans, the trees, every single living entity that breathes life into this island continent they call Australia always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, I want to preface this yarn today by saying that nothing I stay here will be extraordinary. I am not extraordinary. I'm simply a manifestation of my ancestors' struggle for survival. It is by their grace that I do this work. Nothing I say will not have already been said by hundreds of people before me. And I acknowledge that all of the theorising about these subjects have been spoken of by people before me. My contribution builds on the work of my old people. I indeed stand on the shoulders of giants. This screen that I have up now is Bungel. The eagle here is Manyachi, which is, I guess, roughly translates to a totem. He's um, what care takes for me and is my creator. I also want to say the things I'm going to talk about today, I, I don't hold myself out to be an expert on these matters. However, I do have some expertise in this area and will speak today from my own lived experience and from my own standpoint. That is that I'm representing my own view on very complex matters. My presentation today will incorporate stories and my experiences. Storytelling is central to the way we make meaning of the world, central to our ways of being, knowing and doing. I story to a prioritise Aboriginal voice. I story to honour the ways of the old and I story as a way of decolonising knowledges because I stand here today seeking to explain ancient concepts in a foreign tongue. So to story is to disrupt existing hegemonies. It is a way to counter the epistemic violence perpetrated against my people for the past 233 years. It is, as Alana said, the university is complicit in that epistemic violence against my people. So sharing stories is a form of medicine. When we share stories with each other, we heal each other. Storying is a way to hold true our knowledges that have been plundered by colonialists for centuries. I accept, however, that academia demands objectivity, but I stand today firm in the view that our subjectivity has been and always will be our strength. For all I talk about today is intimately mine. It is the foundation of my existence and has become the nature of my resistance. We are indeed, as Aboriginal people, knowledge keepers. So before I start my lecture, because yep, I haven't quite started yet, <laughs> I just wanted to say a, a couple of things. I've made some notes, which I'll refer to during the presentation. And it's something that I find myself doing more and more when I speak. And the reason for this is because I want to be quite specific and considered with the words and language that I use and very deliberate about the information I present. Bell Hooks reminds us that language is a site of struggle, and they are right. Language is anything but inert. One of the reasons I am conscious of the words I use and the spaces I deploy them is that I am still tethered to the system on parole. So anything I say about the system has the very real capacity to threaten my liberty, therefore my life. And secondly, 
When Blackfellas speak up and speak out about matters which affect us, we are often disregarded or dismissed as angry or aggressive. This means that we have to moderate what we say so that you will hear us. It's additional labour, but I am learning that it is essential labour. I've been given an hour to speak today. Um, I thought I'd have a bit of a yarn to start with and then provide an opportunity for questions because otherwise I feel like I'll be talking at you for a very long time. And while everyone at home thinks I like the sound of my own voice, I'm, I'm actually a fairly shy person, which surprises people. Um, but I also think that all learning, both yours and mine, comes through interaction. So I think that we're all um, used to doing business via Zoom these days, but given my commitment to anti-oppressive spaces that do not reinscribe social relations or centre whiteness, I have a few different ideas about Zoom etiquette that I'd like to consider in this lecture in order to create a brave, inclusive and respectful learning space. Um, my pronouns are she and her, and if you would like me to know yours, please feel free to put them in the chat or direct message them to me. Um, please put your microphone on mute unless you are speaking, and if you're not sure how to do that, please let me know. Feel free to have your camera on. It helps me if I can see your face, but I also understand that not everyone is comfortable with the camera on, nor does everyone have stable internet. Um, secondly, time is a colonial construct. And while I hope you're su super eager to listen to what I have to say, I also recognise that life can get in the way sometimes. So if you need to attend to children or take a quick break, I'm fine with that. In this session, I will cover some issues that will make you uncomfortable and ask you to sit with this discomfort. This session is not about your discomfort, rather it's about reflecting on your privilege and thinking about the ways you can activate your privilege and capacities to live in this country in better ways. Um, but look after yourself, set parameters for yourself to maintain your own peace and energy. If you're not feeling comfortable, please message me privately in the chat or to your tutor, Alana. And if you need to eat or drink or get a sip or a, cup, a sip of a cup of coffee, please feel free to. Um, my pr presentation will reference self-harm, carceral assault and trauma. So should you feel any distress, please contact your lecturer in order to access support. It is not my intention to cause anybody any distress, but it is impossible to talk about the carceral system without talking about the violence of it. Both things go hand in hand. As for questions, I will give some time at the end for questions. So please ask them. You are welcome to put them in the chat um, or private message them to me. Um, I'm here to share and welcome any questions or comments. I find this flowchart quite useful. It helps us ensure that we are thoughtful about the quality of our questions and that we've considered whether it really needs to be asked or whether it should be asked. When we are respectful in our questions, we can shift how we interact with each other and make a lecture not just better, but a safe and enriching place to learn. Okay, so to start off with me, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself. Situating myself in my work is a cultural practice and a responsibility passed down to be my, by my old people. And I think it's really important for context and it's our way. By way of introduction, I descend from the Gunditjmara people. My blood carries the stories, the songs and the wisdoms of all of my grandmother's past and my bones will eventually return to the earth which birthed my mother and where our warriors lay their head in eternal rest. Gunditjmara country spans the southwestern areas of the lands you now call Victoria. My mother was raised, raised away from country and grew up on Jebel and Jarawa nation, coming to live on Ghana country as an adult. My family's connection with their own nation was disrupted when Makukun was moved from Victoria to Sydney and then separated from my linear. I have three children up on the screen who are also Narangeri, Bowen Dick and Maori. And while I don't speak any of my languages fluently, I speak several partial languages which form the unique dialect of Aboriginal English. I am a criminalised woman, having spent three years on bail, four weeks in the Supreme Court of South Australia. Um, sorry, my screen is just having a little bit of a meltdown. There we go. Nope. Sorry. Uh, there we go. Uh, so two years in prison and a cumulative two years on home detention. I've completed 18 months on parole and will be tethered to the state for two more years on parole, or as I call it, open air prison. I am number 177057. 
I am one of this country's disposable people. I've made mistakes in my past and some of them were despicable. I remain an unwilling pawn in the colonial project and my criminal record has forever altered my dialogical relationship with the state. In fact, I will likely never be free of their bonds and perhaps as an Aboriginal woman, that was inevitable. Add to that, my face was splashed across the TV and newspapers. My life became a magazine anyone could thumb through. The reason I'm telling you this is not to offer myself up for your judgment, because I'm not, but because I know that, as I said, the Academy likes its information bundled in packages of objectivity, but this presentation will be completely cloaked in subjectivity, or as Tyson Yonker Porter calls it, a filthy reality of belongingness, because I will speak today as a criminalised black woman in this country. And I think this will bring to you an authentic and genuine talk in a way you would otherwise not get. You'll also note in my introduction, I've not made reference to the nature of my crime. I find it very unuseful to tell you whether it was a violent or non-violent crime. In fact, I find the good, bad, violent, non-violent, white collar, blue collar, sex offence, non-sex offence binaries entirely unhelpful, particularly in the public discourse as they create an unhelpful dichotomy in the minds of citizens. When we employ those binaries, we are setting one group apart from another. And the byproduct of that is that we judge one group more harshly and we say that one group deserves a different kind of humanity than the other. Further, the divide between nonviolent and violent crimes ignores the root causes of harm and violence, as well as society's failure to recognise and address these forms of violence. And it sidesteps more fraught conversations about racial capitalism, poverty, race, heteropatriarchy and gender violence as pathways to prison and the need to end them. So I almost had to cancel um, this lecture. I've been incredibly unwell and have been in the grips of post-prison, post-traumatic stress for the past month. I haven't been sleeping and my nightmares are back. They're so bad that I can smell my attacker I can taste him and when my partner tries to rouse me from my fright and slumber I lash out at him unaware of who he is who I am or where I am um, I can't drive because I've been seeing things and swerving when I think there's someone on the road and I've been having these dissociative episodes like the kind that post-combat victims suffer um, and to the point of losing my bladder sometimes in fear. And this has been happening when I've been out at shopping or at home. And I don't, I can't tell when these will strike. Um, and most fearfully, when I, it happens, I don't know where I am. And, you know, at times I've found myself not even at home, that I've ended up down the end of the street or in a creek because I'm not sure how I got there or why. And I started self-harming again as a way of grounding myself. And that escalates from me bruising myself to cutting to burning and it's cyclical. It just, I keep doing it. It becomes a compulsion and I end up becoming ravaged with cuts. And the only relief from the mental torment is watching sort of crimson trails spill from my body. And I tell you this because this is what prison does. Prison is the real thief. It steals from you and it steals from you what you can never get back. Time dignity, respect, your past, your future, your dreams, your sanity, it takes and it keeps taking long after the bars have disappeared. And I know this and I know it's done this to me and I know that the violence of the carceral state has left these great welts and scars across my body that no balm can ever heal. And I guess when I went to prison, I always knew prisons were not a great place. I mean, we all do, right? That's how they work. They rely on inducing fear in the general public. It's their brand of deterrence. And ironically, I used to volunteer in the visitor centre of the local men's prison, helping in the canteen and sitting with kids. And I hated seeing so many black faces in those spaces. I hated the violence of the prison. I hated the hopelessness of the system. But back then, I was one of those people that thought the system was broken. I thought it could be fixed. I thought it could be better. I thought it could be more humane. I thought it could be more effective. I mean, more humane and effective cages. What was I thinking? And then I went to prison. The day I arrived at prison, 
I cried so much that I looked like I had two black eyes. At my, what they call induction, my name was taken from me and I was issued with a six digit number as my identification. And I was told to memorize that number. I was stripped and searched. I was showered and scrubbed and my hair was checked for head lice. I was weighed and then I was dressed again in prison issued clothes, grey track pants with a matching grey t-shirt and institutional bleakness that matched the mood of the place. I was told not to fuck any of the girls and I wasn't warned that it was the predation of the guards that I should actually be worried about. For the first 10 months, I sat in a misery bubble. I barely spoke to anyone. My hair hung across my face and my eyes were always downcast. I spent quite a bit of time in solitary in a hard cell and I rarely went out in the yard. Not that there really was very much yard time. There was a half an hour a week. I lost over 20 kilos because I couldn't eat for the deep sadness I felt in my heart. Like it felt like Someone had filled my heart with rocks. It was so heavy I could barely carry it around anymore. And I was pining for my kids. I was scared and I was scared that I wouldn't make it home, that I would be killed in there because, I mean, that's what happens in those places. As a black woman, I knew that. But then about 15 months in, to prison I got angry so fucking angry at that place angry at what was happening to me at what was happening to my brothers sisters and kin in cages next to me and I realized that this was a system killing by design this was a system criminalizing by design this was a system operating exactly how the colony intended this system was not broken this system was working exactly as designed as a set of interlocking practices, laws and fantasies that liquidate entire life worlds, particularly black, gender non-conforming, disabled lives. And ironically, this was a system enacted under the banner of safety and justice. This was a system enacted to keep people like you safe from people like me. And worse, this system was a weapon in the arsenal of the settler colonial war machine and every bullet it fired hit its target and its target were my people. And anger is a very productive emotion for me. It always has been. And the day I walked out of those prison gates, I looked back, not for the sake of nostalgia, but to say silent to my, silently to myself, I will be back, not to be held captive by your bars, but to tear them down. And I will not rest until every single brick and bar is removed and every one of my people is freed from those cages. So this part of the lecture, I'm just gonna speak at you and then there'll be time for questions. So please feel free to ask questions and maybe, I don't know if you can raise a hand and I'll try and keep an eye on it. But it's really important throughout your uni degree that you have an opportunity to hear from people who have been to prison. So often people working in and around these spaces fail to really be honest about the power dynamics they operate within, feigning partnerships with criminalised people, but mostly making their careers off the backs of our oppression. If you're serious about doing any work in this space and you want to make a difference, you must hold yourself accountable first because degrees, research and commendations do not automatically make you qualified to lead any work in this area. Unless you know these oppressions intimately, you cannot be the expert, no matter your degree, your level of compassion or your level of proximity to this oppression. I am not a criminologist and I am firm in the view that we should interrogate the criminological frameworks and critique the discipline as it presents currently as a technology in service to imperialism. If any of you have read any of Agazzino or Tori's work, you will know that both argue that colonial paradigms are central to the work of criminologists. And I argue that it's vital to interrogate criminology because it continues to define and legitimise social, legal and political parameters that criminalise Indigenous people and has been used to justify the actions of the coloniser by giving their will a scientific basis. It's why I argue that University degrees like these ones, criminology and law, any social sciences must include the voices of criminalised black people in them. Because voice and representation are critical. Who is speaking, who are, who, to whom they are speaking, the language used 
and the discourse is all critically important. Old mate Foucault reminds us that language has power. Foucault talks about regimes of truth and it is through these le this lens that we can consider how different universities degrees act as sciences that reinforce the discourses of Aboriginal deviances over and over again using language as a discursive formation which becomes both constitutive and productive resulting in the framing and constraining of understandings of my people. Certainly the language that is employed regarding criminality deviance and criminalised people constrains and constructs. Language is not without effect. And to this end, language is a form of epistemic violence, especially when weaponised by the academy. Not to mention the labels further stigmatise an already stigmatised population. A friend of mine often says that labels are good for jars, just not people. To this end, I encourage you to consider the intersectional and complex drivers of contemporary Indigenous overrepresentation in the criminal punishment system, but to not do this in a way that you ground your papers or research or upcoming assignments in a language of deficit. Deficit language is a mode of language that consistently frames Aboriginal identity in a narrative of deficiency and is grossly embedded within a race paradigm. All of the work I do seeks to turn the gaze back to the coloniser and quite squarely situate and apportion responsibility with colonial forces and state agents of the colonial project. Basically, I am interested in pathologising the colonial body. My work seeks to support the personal community, cultural and political struggles and aspirations of Aboriginal people. And even my presentation here today has an unashamed and distinct politicality to it. Um, when I came out of prison, I noticed this very peculiar thing happened. Every time I wanted to speak out about my experience within the criminal punishment system, there was a concerted censoring on, of my voice every single time I spoke. Now, this came at me at, in various ways, aggressively, subtly and on the sly and very publicly at times. Most obviously, and I dare say predictably, the system didn't like me speaking about my experiences in custody or me raising publicly the violence and brutality of the system. I mean, like every abusive relationship, it thrives off of silence, right? Then there were the criminologists who wanted to trade off my stories and experiences for their own gain. I was never referenced in the articles they built off my stories or acknowledged for the critical analysis of the structural and violent oppression of prisons. Then were the academics and some members of the media who would welcome my lived experience voice conditionally conditions they arbitrarily set for me without even telling me and just like that I was before a panel of judges again watching them adjudicate my worth and humanity. The legitimacy and elevation of my voice seemed to be solely dependent on a couple of things and I want to lay them out for you and I've got a slide but I'm just going to flick through to that okay the conditions were one inclusion of my criminalized voice was dependent on my desistance because voices of those in the system are only useful if we are reformed corrected and in my case no longer the savage the colony imagined and secondly my opportunity to speak was entirely dependent on the type and nature of my offending and thirdly, the elevation of my voice was dependent absolutely on my ability to articulate my view or position objectively, because apparently subjectivity is, as I said, filthy, messy and worse, rendered my views useless. So the reality is I am one of this country's disposable people and worse, I'm a criminalised black woman in a colonial settler state violently founded upon policies and practices seeking to erase, eradicate, breed out, extinguish, deny and invisibilise my kind. I am black and I have survived, but more than 450 of my people have not. At today's count, more, hundred, more than 475 Aboriginal men and women have been killed by your carceral system since 1991. This is a system which represents nothing more than a brutal, violent and deadly colonial frontier. Now, we know that this number grows exponentially when you count deaths beyond 1991. We know that this figure grows exponentially when you count deaths that are as a result of the carceral system. This figure does not count deaths of people on parole. It does not count deaths of babies killed in mother's wombs while they're in prison. 
It does not count deaths of babies killed in childbirth in prisons. So this number is a very conservative figure. And I'd just like everyone to remember that because it's a gross figure, but is a very conservative figure. Right now, there are approximately 12,000 Aboriginal people in prison. More than a quarter of the prison population is my people. Three quarters of us have been to prison before. We are overrepresented in every area of the criminal injustice system. And once we go through that door, we revolve around time and time again. But the disproportionate rate of Aboriginal incarceration in this country is not a new phenomenon. Almost three decades ago, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody noted that we are arguably the most incarcerated group of First Peoples in the world. And I just want to make a note here to say that the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody was a watershed document, but it was actually part of a longer Aboriginal community discourse that had sought since the violent invasion of this country to reduce Aboriginal contact with the colonial criminal punishment system. So yes, it was a, a watershed document, but we've been banging on about this for years. And I argue that the only people who benefit from royal commissions are the people conducting them. And of course, the delegates of the Uluru Statement from the Heart assert that we are not an innately criminal people. We know that colonisation criminalises our people. Our very existence and survival has become an act of radical revolution. Colonisation abuses black minds, black bodies, black lands, black waters. Colonisation locks us out of housing markets, job markets and labour markets. And this colony is built on a bedrock of intergenerational economic prosperity whereby the government gives white people free stuff while purposefully not giving those same resources and opportunities to us. And then the irony of those handouts becoming the stereotype of contemporary Aboriginality. So sadly, our grandmothers, mothers, sisters and aunties are left to grieve, grieve the loss of their sons and daughters to every kind of colonial frontier that exists in this country. This is a time of black rage, black grief and perpetual torment since white men first stepped on our shores. So um, I want to just pause now and just see if there's any questions. And then what I was hoping to do is um, I wanted to talk a little bit about abolition. So um, does anyone have any burning questions before we get to that bit? I can't see everyone's faces, so I'm just going to do that. No? Okay. I'm going to skip ahead and just... I'm, I'm a chronic over-preparer, so I've got like about 70 pages of work that I could have talked at you for like seven hours. So I'm going to skip right. So, um, right, so when, when I came out of prison, as I said to you, I was angry. Like I was filthy angry. I was angry at this system. I was angry what I was seeing it doing. And as I said, I realised that this was not a broken system. I think it's really lazy when we say these systems are broken. I think it's lazy politics. I think it's lazy policy. And I think that it's easy for us to think that things are broken because we don't have to interrogate them. And we don't have to own up to the fact that these things are being done in our name because that's the reality. This justice system is your system. This is not my people's system. This is your system. And... Every one of you needs to sit back and go, are we actually happy that this is happening in our name? So I became an abolitionist. I came out of prison and I said, this is not going to happen anymore. This is not going to happen to my people. I believe that the only way to liberate my people is through the abolition of the entire prison industrial complex, because I see abolition as demanding the total destruction of the world as we know it, the end of the capitalist carceral state and all the systems of violence that enable it. I'm going to say that again because it's really important and it's, it, it sounds huge. It's the end of the capitalist carceral state and all the systems of violence that enable it. And I don't even see this aim as negative or simply centred on annihilation. Rather, abolition is productive work that's carves out space for us to imagine other worlds, other futures, and provides us with a toolbox to build them. For me, the strength of abolition is that it invites us to dream collectively, to disturb, 
and to refuse to compromise. The strategies of abolition are anti-capitalist, they're intersectional, inclusive, anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-homophobic, anti-transphobic, feminist, inter internationalist, environmental, pro-cooperation, and also a very necessary element of the decolonial struggle, because you cannot have decolonization without abolition. And abolition is rooted in collective care and values of mutual aid. It's a movement grounded in love and care and deep respect. And every time I speak at something and say, we just need to love each other a little bit more, everyone thinks I'm being really Pollyanna. And I, I really don't understand why love as a solution has become such a radical concept, but it really has. Like when I say that to people, we just need to love each other a little bit more. They think I'm crazy and that it's, I, I don't understand how that's become so radical, but it has. And I, I don't understand that. But abolition is about changing all of the conditions and forces that feed and enable the prison industrial complex so that we don't have to rely on those institutions anymore to flourish. And when I talk about the prison industrial complex, I refer back to those overlapping interests of the state and industry that employ policing, surveillance, imprisonment and punishment as a means of controlling populations and furthering the colonial project. The prison industrial complex both feeds on and maintains oppression and inequalities through the machinations of power, punishment, violence and control. So abolition is not just about closing the doors to violent institutions, but also about building up and recovering institutions and practices and relationships that nurture wholeness, self-determination and transformation. Abolition is not some distant future, but something we create in every moment when we say no to the traps of colonialism and yes to the nourishing possibilities dreamed of and practiced by our ancestors. So yes, it is tearing down prisons and disestablishing and abolishing police and secretly that's kind of the bit that I like the most, but it is also a building project, a reconstructive process. Abolition is a verb, it's a doing project and I and as I said, I argue we cannot have abolition and we cannot have decolonization without abolition. I'm just going to stop sharing because I've kind of lost track of my slides. Sorry, gang. Um, I do that a bit. Um, that's not my slide, but someone else. Sorry. So when I talk about abolition, I think about the perpetual and enduring mourning in our community. I think specifically back to a time and what, what is critical for me is a time when 19-year-old Walpuri man, Kuma J. Walker, had been brutally murdered in his hometown by a police officer. And we took to the streets in solidarity with the family and to express our grief very publicly over his death and in protest of the violence police perpetrated in our communities. Gatherings were held here on Ghana country at Parliament House and we stood with red painted hands and listened to family members and demanded answers, truth and justice. At that stage, we'd recorded more than 400 deaths in custody. And then our mother delivered onto us a virus that we could barely contain. We watched as she made a home in the throats of many, squeezing and strangling the life from us. And as the city closed and the planes were grounded and the borders closed, we watched on as a prime minister who believes in the second coming, raised his hand to his creator, stood with his brethren and proselytized the power of thoughts and prayers as a solution to man-made evils. And while we all stayed in our homes and washed our hands and worried where we'd find our next roll of toilet paper, George Floyd Jr. was murdered on the streets of Minneapolis. And from our own lounge rooms, we watched a world erupt. We watched our black brothers and sisters in America rise up and demand justice. We watched them pump their fists in the air and scream Black Lives Matter. We watched them take to the streets as one of their own had muttered the words, I can't breathe, as a police officer, an agent of so-called justice and community safety, extinguished a black man's last breath by crushing his windpipe with his knee. And then what we as blackfellas saw was a ricochet effect across the world which rippled right across the seas to this island continent you call Australia. We saw people in this country rise up and say Black Lives Matter. And we paused, did a double take and thought to ourselves which Black Lives because we were not sure that our Black Lives or Black Bodies ever mattered unless in service or sacrifice to the colony. 
But even amid that confusion, the hypocrisy of people holding another country to account for the same sins committed on these souls in the name of justice, good order and safety and morality, we saw an opportunity. This was a crucible moment. This was an opportunity for revolutionary transformation and we seized on it. So no, we didn't create a movement. We just had an opportunity to elevate the our ongoing resistance movement that was born in 1788. So we're not new to this, but we are absolutely true to it. So these days, quite surprisingly to me, Abolition has become the preeminent demand of the movement. So before I hand this over to you to ask any questions you might have about my experience or anything I've spoken of today, I want to say that I'm talking very loudly and most oftentimes very publicly, that it is not okay that we are murdering and brutalising black people behind bars, in the back of correctional services vans, in police cells and on the streets. We have to start to imagine a different kind of justice a justice for everyone, a justice free of prisons, policing and surveillance. We right now have an opportunity to imagine a future free of punishment, imprisonment and exile. And, you know, abolition does for some people sound like a radical new idea, but people have been working towards it for decades. Certainly Aboriginal people have been in fighting against the enslaving and incarcerating of our people for 233 years. Safety, individual or community safety cannot come without freedom and justice because who we are and what we are comes from the alchemy of our struggles. If we dismantle systems that cage and punish, we can explicitly fight genocide and dispossession and create a world focused on radical reciprocity and accountability. And while abolition is the preeminent demand of the movement, abolition needs to be more than just a political vision. It needs to be the will of the people because we have an opportunity now to develop revolutionary and transformative community-based solutions rather than rely on a system that reinforces and perpetuates violence. This is a crucible moment. We are seeing a powerful condemnation of racism and carceral violence across the world. The call to build a world in which the prison industrial complex is obsolete has never been louder. But this is also a troubling moment. This is a troubling moment because it is characterised by a renewed confidence amongst far-right groups. I guess made more confident and emboldened by the past elections of Trump, Boris Johnson and even Scott Morrison and their nationalistic rhetoric and conservative politics. But there is a similar renewal among anti-racists and anti-fascists. So this is our chance to dismantle policies, practices and institutions that make people disposable because we absolutely should challenge the ubiquitous belief that there are throwaway people. This is our chance to abolish systems and professions that are anti-Black and pro-colonial. Abolition is a necessary element of decolonial struggle. It's rooted in colonial care and values of mutual aid. More immediate demands of abolition propose alternatives in the form of specific services for mental health support, sexual violence intervention and community dispute resolution. Other ideas stress the need for guaranteed essential services like housing, education and health care. Many others take cues from pre-colonial Indigenous practices of community justice, which stress accountability and redress over punishment. In most cases, the long-term goal is a wholesale restructuring of society with a greater concern for human well-being. And I don't have all the answers, but that is actually the fun part. Imagining abolition lets us start dialogues of curiosity, to enter realms of possibility, to imagine ways to centre community, to focus on abundance and healing, not scarcity and harm, to imagine transformative approaches which prioritise health and well-being and safety. We literally have an opportunity to build a world focused on radical reciprocity, not retribution and revenge. And while we might not all be on the same page about what abolition looks like or what it will look like, but that's cool because like Ruth Wilson Gilmore says, it's important to spar and to work out our differences because not everyone in the room and certainly not everyone in the abolitionist movement is on the same page and there's no need to pretend otherwise. There's real strength in that difference. That's not to say that we will entertain some watered down version of abolition where reform creeps in as a compromise. But as I said, abolition is a verb. We are doers. We're doing two pronged work, tearing down and dismantling and disestablishing all systems that suck the very life from our black souls while building up new systems which breathe the life back into community and care.
As Marian Carver says, abolition is in the present. We are doing it every single day in multiple kinds of ways. It's not just a horizon we'll arrive at someday, it's constantly being made. So it's important to remember we're going to have to test, try, pioneer and pilot. So um, I will finish up here and hand over for questions because um, I have like 7 million more bits of things to say. Um, but I want to thank Alana for having me here today and um, say it's really important that in all your university work that you seek out the voices of those with lived experience in whatever you're talking about. So when you're writing a paper and if you're writing about Aboriginal issues, please cite Black, seek out Aboriginal scholars. If you're writing about prison issues or deaths in custody, seek out the voices of people with lived prison experience or family members who've had people dying in custody. Please reference us. Um, it's, it's a way of unsettling and disrupting the hegemony because the thing is about university spaces, they're sites of violence. And unless you're prepared to elevate our voices, you're just perpetuating that same level of violence that universities do. Um, the last thing I would ask yourselves to do, and I had this up on a slide, but I had lost track of all my slides, is to every day reflect on your own personal behaviours and actions and consider how they may reinforce and uphold harmful and toxic structures and ask yourself above all are you ensuring that every day you exist in a manner which actively opposes the white supremacist superstructure and fights for all humanity because that's what matters right now that's what matters in every day and that's abolition in action <laughs>